It's my great pleasure to start off by introducing David Gondek, who's based in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at UCL as a research fellow in social life course epidemiology. He works on the project exploring early life adversities and mental health over the life course using large population cohorts. David received his PhD from the Centre for Longitudinal Studies at UCL, where his thesis was focused on longitudinal and cross cohorts, trends in mental and physical health using the British birth cohorts. Before his PhD, David completed an MSc in Clinical Mental Health Sciences at UCL and worked on research related to mental health provision among young people and in migrant populations. And he's talking about adverse childhood experiences and multiple mental health outcomes through adulthood, an analysis of the 1958 British birth cohort. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the introductions and thank you for having me. So I will present a, a body of work on adverse childhood experiences and how they are linked to mental health outcomes throughout adulthood. And this is the analysis of 1958 British birth cohort. And also I would like to thank my co first. Uh, so adverse childhood experiences typically are defined as traumatic, stressful, psychosocial events, conditions that tend to co-care, persist over time, and are outside of child's control. And these tend to include abuse, different forms of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual neglect, but also, uh, I'm just going to this, also household dysfunction, for example, mental uh, illness among parents, uh, interpersonal violence, divorce, substance abuse, uh, events like that. So. There's a lot of research showing that uh, ACEs, so adverse childhood experiences, are linked to mental health, that they are bad for mental health, even several decades later. Um, and and it, it, despite the large amount of literature, there's still a lot of limitations we, which I think we can address, especially with uh, our great cohort studies. So for example, ACEs tend to be reported retrospectively rather than prospectively. And this, is, this uh, has a lot of biases. Uh, a lot of research is cross-sectional rather than longitudinal, tends to focus on individual mental health outcomes rather than a range of outcomes, which makes a comparison of uh, different outcomes difficult, direct comparisons. Quite often the studies are not adjusted for important confounding, for, for example, family characteristics, because simply this data is not there, and they focus on individual ACEs or some kind of summed up scores uh, rather than exploring both types of uh, exposure. So this uh, research uh, was eventually split into two separate studies and that's how I'm going to present it. They're both uh, uh, under review and they can be uh, found online as preprints. So I'm not going to, I'm going to try to focus on the findings without boring you on the methodological details. So you can read up on those yourself. So study number one looks at how strong is the association between ACEs and a range of mental health outcomes measured between age 16 and 55. And in study number two, we looked at how strong the association is between ACEs and trajectory specifically uh, of psychological stress between age 23 and 50. So the idea behind this research was to uh, use this um, so-called outcome-wide longitudinal design. So it's a term coined by Van der Veel, and, he's, and he proposes that when we have the data on several uh, related outcomes and we're interested in a given exposure, we should include those outcomes. We should just have them there in the study because then it's just much more efficient. We are looking at the same exposures, we are looking at the same covariates, the same sample, so we can directly compare effect sizes. Uh, so when these big meta-analysis are, are being done, it's just we make life easier of, of the researchers and of the readers. So that's what I try to do in my work. And I'm using, as I mentioned, I'm using the NCDS data, so the birth cohort of those born in one particular week in 1958. The current sample is around 8,000. Uh, my ACEs were uh, measured both prospectively and retrospectively, and all the findings, all the estimates I'm presenting here are adjusted for the same covariates. So the gender, father's occupational, social class, maternal education, birth weight, gestational age, maternal age of birth, and breastfeeding duration. And the range of outcomes I'm going to present uh, is, uh, includes uh, life satisfaction, quality of life, self-rated health, psychological distress, so that typically includes symptoms of depression, anxiety, any kind of medications taken for mental health problems or visiting a mental health specialist. So this is my ACEs, sorry for the table, but 
And the key here is that prospectively we measured things like separation, divorce, substance misuse, family conflict, death of parent, mental health problems among parents, physical neglect, offending. Retrospectively, we also included things like uh, abuse, different type of abuse and emotional neglect. So just, uh, this, this were the type of adversities we were, we were able to study with the data. Okay, I'm gonna slow down a little bit here. So this is the key findings of study number one. So this shows the association between number of adversities, both measured prospectively and retrospectively, that's on the uh, y-axis, and different outcomes at different ages. Um, I should probably mention here that the outcomes are standardized. So uh, the beta coefficient represents a standard deviation. So we can, we can then talk about effect size in standard deviations. And uh, as mentioned, range of outcomes were included uh, the key message here is that whatever the outcome we are looking at, there are pretty strong effect sizes. The association is pretty strong. Those children who, are exp who experience adversities tend to have worse mental health. And for example, if we look at, for, uh, let's say, having three adversities versus none, uh, we can expect uh, around half a standard deviation of worse mental health on a range of different outcomes on average, which is a pretty strong effect size. And probably there's a marginally stronger association for um, co uh, life kind of um, well-being measures such as life satisfaction or quality of life than measures of depression, anxiety, or general psychological distress. And this figure shows a similar story here. However, uh, included binary outcomes. Uh, so for example, seeing mental health specialists or not seeing mental health specialists within a certain, certain time period and also whenever it was possible, I binarized the continuous uh, outcomes. So when there are some threshold, thresholds available, uh, which would indicate having potentially a diagnosable depression or anxiety, I just cut the variables at that threshold to represent the more kind of severe mental health problems. But it's again, the same story as previously. So uh, experiencing adversities linked with between 50 and 150% higher risk of having a mental health problem later in the life. Okay, so in study two, uh, instead of looking at age specific associations, we looked at trajectories over time, over age, between age 23 and 50, using the same measure. So in this case, it was malaise inventory, a, a measure of general psychological distress. So the idea behind this is that we can see if these associations change with age. So if, uh, ad if adversity is having a stronger uh, association or impact on mental health over time or, or this uh, impact diminishes over time or stays relatively stable. I would say the conclusion here is that it stays relatively st stable. So we see differences already at age 23 or potentially earlier if we had the data and they remain equally strong up to age 50. The same uh, conclusion is for individual uh, ACEs. Uh, so again, this is just trajectories, but uh, stratified by type of adversity. And so except of parental death, which didn't have such a harmful effect as, as others, we see a similar trajectory across, across all of them. And this specifically, those adversities specifically were reported pros uh, prospectively. And on this side, there are retrospective measures. So they, they tend to have slightly stronger associations with uh, with mental health. So as, as you would expect, uh, abuse has a quite strong effect. But interestingly, family conflict, which one would expect maybe not being as severe uh, experience, actually has quite strong association, like right? even stronger in physical abuse and comparable to so psychological, psychological abuse. So I think that's an interesting finding. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's the, uh, that's the key. Parental separation, divorce actually didn't have as strong effect as other uh, adversities. Okay, so seeing that there is a quite large spread of those trajectories, individual trajectories uh, across uh, adulthood, we try to identify groups or subgroups of trajectories which, are, which were uh, similar uh, with a, a, mixed, uh, um, a mixed effects model. So we identify four subgroups 
So the largest one with 75, 74% experience relatively low uh, and stable symptoms over their adulthood. Uh, and then three other groups experienced between moderate and high uh, or severe symptoms uh, throughout their adulthood. So we, so we identified those four groups. And then after identifying those groups, we wanted to see how strong is the association between experiencing adversities and being in one of, in, in one of those groups. So for example, we can see here that even having just one adversity is already associated with twice as strong risk of being a high symptoms group compared to the low symptoms, where, for example, having four or more adversities, it's almost six, it's associated with almost six times as strong risk in a being in being high in high yeah. symptoms group compared to low symptom group. However, still 60% uh, children who experience two or more adversities and 54% of children who experience four or more adversities were in the low symptoms group. So despite having uh, experienced uh, 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 quite a number of, of quite severe uh, adversities in their childhood, those children still didn't develop serious mental health problems. So our question was what we're interested in after seeing that mm -hmm. what, what distinguishes those resilient children from the children who after experiencing adversities did develop mental health problems. So what, how they might differ. And we hypothesize a number of ca characteristics which might uh, buffer the, the impact of adversities on mental health. And this included father's occupation, social class, uh, gender, parental involvement. So I think, I don't remember exactly, but this includes questions like the mom and dad reads to the child, uh, I think they spent uh, uh, um, time doing activities with the child, this kind of questions. Cognitive ability, consciousness, internalizing, externalizing problems and physical health problems. And even though these uh, characteristics were strongly related to mental health, they did, uh, resilient children did not differ according to those from those non-resilient children. So, so uh, we just ran a, a series of interactions and we didn't find that they made children with adversities, they didn't make their mental health worse, but also it didn't improve mental health of children who, uh, who already experienced adversity. So, so it just simply, there was no effect modification according to uh, Which was quite surprising actually. Um, we, we would expect that at least some of these, like, I don't know, cognitive ability or, or, or having a, a other mental health problems in adolescence would have some kind of effect, but surprisingly, they, they didn't. Okay, so the take home messages from this research. Uh, so ACEs are, are bad for mental health, are very harmful, and are persistently harmful throughout the whole adulthood and are cumulatively harmful. So the more, the higher number of adversities, the worse mental health gets, this, this is of no surprise. And this is true regardless of the type of adversity, how they're measured, if they're measured prospectively or retrospectively, the way mental health is measured, so being well, well-being type of outcome or, or uh, uh, depression, anxiety, or symptoms of both. And they didn't present that, but also these findings were quite robust to different um, analytical decisions to do with missing data, sample definitions, coding of these variables, uh, or, or different confounding sets. And however, we still have to remember that most children with ACEs do not develop mental health problems. And probably the next step is to understand what distinguishes in these resilient children from those who are not as lucky to, uh, and, and, and who then go on and have mental health problems over their life course. Okay, I, have, I think I have a, a little bit more time, but I will stop here. So thank you a lot for listening. And also thank you for uh, all the great work on the catalog of mental health uh, measures because it just makes life so, so much easier. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm open to, to questions. Thank you so much. So Latif Akani is a first year PhD student at the University of Strathclyde. His research aims at investigating the health and well-being effects of the UK national living wage policy. Latif's areas of interest, research interest are in health, labor and de development economics. 
Prior to commencing his PhD, Latif was a research associate at the Centre for the Study of Economies of Africa, CSEA, a policy think tank, think tank based in Nigeria. And he's going to talk to us about income trajectories and health outcomes in the UK, exploring the impact of stability and volatility. I'll give you a two minute warning before the end of your 15 minutes, okay? Uh, thank you, Benny. Uh Good afternoon, everyone. My name, as has been introduced, is Latif. Uh, the paper is uh, is an elementary part of my PhD research, and my overall PhD research is to look at evaluate the impact of the uh, national living wage introduced in 2016 in the UK on health outcomes, health and well-being outcomes. So, before going deep into the policy evaluation, uh, so we decided to look at, okay, income over time, because UK has a very peculiar, I mean, uh, interesting attribute in terms of his wage policy, in, I mean, increasing the wage almost every year uh, since before the national living wage and also since the national living wage has been introduced, the country has a target of trying to meet the median wage. So, uh, uh, just a brief of over, uh, an overview of what we, I'll be talking about, just the background, uh, the data and the method we use, the result and the summary of what we found. So as a bit of background, like I said, uh, the empirical evidence on health impact of uh, income are mixed. Uh, there are different arguments in terms of the direction of impact, whether health is the one causing income, low income. For example, if an individual has a poor health, there's every likelihood that such individual will not be engaged in a very good job and that will affect, affect the income. Also, there are other studies too that I mean, uh, have established that income has implication on health. However, what is very much uh, inconclusive in empirical studies is that increase in income does not necessarily translate into improvement in health. For example, if income goes up, uh, if such individual does not engage in health enhancing consumption, there are studies that have established that it could lead to deteriorating health, smoking, alcohol consumption, obesity, and what have you. There have been studies that have established it. Also, uh, like I mentioned, the socioeconomic status, poverty are very much linked to high mortality and mobility. The, I mean, indicating that low income has implication on health too. So, Increase in income does not necessarily translate to health. However, when income is low or when there is poor socioeconomic status, it might translate into poor health. Then there is a report by the Office of National Statistics in 2018 that uh, summarized that uh, people stay home after the attacks doesn't keep up with inflation. And this tends to make people feel poorer and it leads to declining household real spending. So all this, what this is, background is telling us is that despite the wage policy, despite the increase in income over the years, that may not necessarily have translated into improving health. So what we now try to do is to look at, okay, what is the impact of income over the years, especially prior to introducing the national living oh, wage on our health outcomes. So in addition to this, what we also try to look at is to look at uh, the argument of income gradient and income trajectory. Uh, from the permanent income hypothesis of Friedman, there's this argument that, okay, rather than the transient income, changing the income every year does not necessarily affect or translate into meaningful improvement in people's health and well being. Rather, what should be considered in the permanent income, the overall uh, cycle of income, which are uh, Tend to also, I mean, uh, Benzival in 2001, one of the study, key studies we reviewed, established this also to show that longer term income is more important for health than just the correct income that individual earns. And also that when there's instability in income, income when it is not very much predictable, it could be harmful uh, to health. Then in terms of the empirical approach, we also see in literature, there's this argument about cross-sectional versus longitudinal methods while early studies use cross-sectional approaches, there are some that have also used longitudinal methods trying to address some of the endogeneity bias and uh, confounding issues in the cross-sectional uh, approaches. Another advantage of the longitudinal methods that we, start, we found in literature is that 
uh, the reporting buyers in self-reported health, if you are asking an individual about their health, they are likely going to, you are likely going to get some reporting buyers. But if you ask the same individual, the similar set of questions over time, this could address some of those reporting buyers. Then the third other aspect that we also try to address in the uh, study is the estimation approach now. In using longitudinal approach, what our studies do because of the limitation of using uh, accounting for some effect, like the fixed effect, is to use a uh, dichotomous outcome like poor versus good, yes and no. So recently, there are new or improved method of handling all that outcome. So when the scale of outcome measure is more than two, so can you still account for some of those effects? So, uh, so just in terms of the data and the method now, uh, because we are also trying to focus on longitudinal approach to capture how income over time and affect health and well-being. So we use the Understanding Society survey and we consider 10 waves uh, because of the large data sets, it's about 40,000 households are considered. And between 2009 and 2019 is what we considered. Although when we adjusted the data for similarity of uh, periods, because usually every wave is conducted for more, about 24 months. So what we then do is to make sure every individual income and health is related to the same period. So overall, we have data for 2011 to 2018. Then another advantage of this data is that it has a very detailed measurement of people's income, household income, individual income, and different measures of health and well-being. So we consider this, I mean, five major health outcomes are uh, the general health, uh, the general health questionnaire to do as a proxy for mental health. Then we also consider the long-term uh, disability or chronic health measure, then satisfaction with leisure time and life satisfaction. The how does income affect uh, these five uh, outcomes? So for the baseline model, like uh, I said in the Instagram, we use the fixed effects uh, or the logic model. So what this model did is uh, rather than the binary uh, uh, fixed effect model, it accommodates uh, ordered outcome variables for example, the general health is, is asking people how do they feel I mean, in terms of their general health. And there are five options between poor, uh, fair, good, and excellent, about five categories. For mental health, for example, the caseness, the GHQ 12 has about 12 plus at least about 13. So with all this different scale, rather than do what other studies do, trying to now we categorize into poor versus good, we try to, I mean, use the variables the way they are collected rather than altering them to not bias whatever result or whatever outcome we'll be getting. And so for the baseline model, uh, we consider the, the impact of the uh, household income. We also consider some um, uh, covariates like uh, the age, the occupation of household age, uh, the the number of individuals employed in the household and other, other, other factors. So for the baseline model, that is another. that. Then we now also move forward to look at the income trajectory. That, okay, stability in income, volatility in income, these are different concepts. Apart from the income itself, how stable household income is or an individual income is, how does it influence their health? And when income is volatile too, how does it influence their health? So overall, we considered about four different uh, predictor, I mean, uh, variables there. So rather than using the household income now, we consider the stability in household income, which we measured as the average of the household income over time. The volatility in income also, we use uh, the standard deviation of uh, the act percentage of income. Then the last two models, or the last two very I mean, models we considered, one is on the duration of income spell, that okay, when a household spend so much time as a low earner, it tends to have different impacts compared to an household that earn above the median income. So apart from the baseline model, which consider the household disposable income, so the other four category of uh, models we estimated, look at different concepts of income and how each of these concepts could influence health differently. But for the main results, 
So the baseline model that I highlighted here is just looking at the impacts apart from the other covariates. I only reported the, the main uh, variable of interest there, which are the income measures. So this is looking at the impact of the household risk disposable income over time after we have accounted for inflation and equalized it on their mental health, uh, general health, long-standing uh, disability, satisfaction with leisure and overall life. So in summary, what we've observed here is that increase in income or current income over time has a positive implication or a positive impact on health, both in terms of improvement in general health, improvement in mental health. People tend to report improvement in their health as their income increases over time. Although we didn't, the result does not show any meaningful, any significant relationship for the long-term illness. So for average income now, what we use to measure income stability so we observed that when in average income over time, so here what we did is to use a cross-sectional approach. So we average their income over the nine years period, 2011 to 2018, and we look at the impact of the average over the past nine years on the current health status. So that also shows that there's a positive impact in terms of the average. Then uh, volatility, which we measure as a standard deviation, is negative and significant. Then we now look at, for every year we compute the median income, that okay, what is the median, overall median income for every year? We now consider for every household, are they below or above? So based on the number of years, they fall below the median income. We use that as a proxy to look at the uh, low income uh, spell, and that shows a negative impact that as household continue to fall below median income, it tends to lead to, I mean, decline in the prediction of their health. So while for those that are above consistently over the years, they tend to have positive uh, uh, impact. So uh, based on this result and given our overall interest, which is to look at the impact of the uh, living wage, so we then break our results down, our estimation down into looking at, okay, high ENA or versus low ENA. So in 20, we use the 2018 data, we now divide household into different income quintile. So we have the bottom 20% and the top 20% ENA. So this uh, uh, chart here is just showing the head distribution of the low ENA and the high ENA. So for example, the gray area is showing that people in the bottom 20% tend to report more of poor versus fear health compared to people in the uh, top 20%, which is in the unshaded red cell. Same similar thing for the GHQ, where we use to prove the mental health. It shows that people that are earning better tend to report less distress in their mental health compared to those that are in the low 20%. Also with leisure time, this for leisure time, those that are earning big, majority seems to be less satisfied with their leisure compared to those that are earning low. So this is just a way of showing some of the characteristics of different households and their income distribution. So based on these characteristics, uh, we then- okay. uh, Two partition, minutes. Okay, we then partition our analysis into two to look at low household earners versus high household earners. And our results seems to be consistent also, except that for the average income, rather than have a significant result as we have before, it shows that for low earners, even when their income is stable, because the, the income is low, it doesn't tend to predict improvement in their health significantly compared to the high earners. While for volatile income, they tend to be negative and significant, especially for the general health and the mental health, while similar thing is not observed for the high earners, showing that Although income have implication on health, but when you say income, you need to first look at the threshold of the income before you can begin to discuss uh, whether it's significant or not. But for the sake of time, we also did something here to look at before and after 2016, because 2016 was when the national living wage was introduced. So, and our result also showed that uh, post 2016, there seems to be uh, more relationship or more significant relationship between income and the different measures we use. This table here is just trying to show to us that by the time we go to the policy uh, identification and 
trying to capture those beneficiaries. Does it really have implication? So in summary, uh, our results shows that both current and average income are significant predictors of improvement in health. And we also observe that when household income is stable, they tend to be more likelihood of improvement in, I mean, reporting improvement in their health, while volatile income tend to predict poor health. Then uh, finally, our result also suggested that uh, when income is increasing, there seems to be less contentment, especially for high earners with their uh, leisure time. People tend to be less satisfied with their leisure time when their income is increasing. We tend to, I mean, this tend to suggest that people tend to work more or people tend to want to take up more, I mean, time at work than leisure, which have implication on their leisure time. One of the limitations is that uh, in the, our partitioning and our post and pre-2016 analysis, we didn't really capture the true impact of the policy, like I said, but we are only trying to look at does the significance or the magnitude of impact increases or decreases. Uh, thank you. So we'll now move on to Maria Christodoulou. Um, please play back. Uh, and if you'd like to start sharing your screen. Maria is a postdoctoral researcher in biodemography at, in the Department of Statistics at the University of Oxford. Her training is in evolutionary biology and statistics. And she's going to be talking about erosion of representativeness in a cohort study, which meets, uh, links very neatly to the question that uh, Tammy was asking. Give yes, you, I thought that was an excellent link actually. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on the 1958 British birth cohort, which uh, we've heard a little bit about from uh, David earlier, um, which is, uh, I don't know if you can see my slides changing. Is everything okay? Excellent. Thank you. So the overall piece of work I am involved in is on aging and understanding the underlying trajectories behind aging, human aging, but I'm very interested in reproductive aging, specifically how women age. Uh, the reason I find reproductive aging particularly good to work with is A, it's to me inherently interesting. B, the fertility window is actually very clearly marked. We have events at the beginning and at the end, and we can actually see a whole trajectory of a woman from her menarche, which is the time of the first period, up until menopause. And there is already some understanding on both the genetic influence of timings, but also the socioeconomic impact that may be influencing those timings. It's also a shorter window than lifespan and aging. And it's a little bit less morbid because you're not waiting for people to die to be able to include them in your study, which is, it's an added bonus. Now, fertility itself is hidden. We only observe the results of fertility. We see pregnancies, we see live births, we see unsuccessful pregnancies. And also we are observing the fertility of two individuals through the outcome of a pregnancy. And again, we have very strong links between the environment and sociological impact. And this is when we started considering how we wanted to look into these events. And the 1958 British birth cohort is essentially the perfect data set for us. Initially designed to study perinatal mortality, it was set up to see essentially early, early deaths for children. It included all births that occurred in the first week of March, 1958. Uh, that was over 17,000 individuals. And the idea of including absolutely everybody who was born in that specific week gives us a very good idea of all sorts of ways of life, parts of the UK. All these factors are just included within the study. We've had, up until age 16, there were also replenishing sweeps, which included people who were born outside the UK, but moved into the UK by age 16, which means that after that age, they were living within the country. And then since then, they have been followed and the study has changed hands a few times, but a vast trove of incredible variables have been collected over 
actually more than nine suites, but nine were the release ones that we have studied. And in 2002, there was a biomedical survey, which was used to also get some collections that was used for DNA work. As a study, it is extraordinary in its ability to give us information about all aspects of life. And because of its sampling strategy, every birth in that one week, uh, it has been considered a representative study for the UK population. And by looking at, for example, the general characteristics in terms of BMI or socioeconomic background, early in life versus age 40, there have been studies who have demonstrated that it has remained in its broad strokes quite representative. But for me, representativeness only makes sense in the context of the question you're asking. Something can only be representative based on what it is you're looking for. Something can't be representative of a whole population for all aspects. Some things it will be perfectly spot on and for others it won't be. So as we were looking at fertility, I wanted to see how well everything would match the actual national statistics we have. We are actually extremely lucky in our specific field that we have national statistics to compare against and to understand how the cohort behaves against other people of their age group. So the first thing I wanted to get my head around is how many people stayed and how many people left and how many of them were male and how many that were female and how many actually stayed to be genotyped or at least up until the wave when they were genotyped. Uh, and I'm a visual person, so I started drawing it out and doing mind maps about who comes in and who goes out and who has stayed up until and we do see an attrition, which is unsurprising and has been studied extensively. But the idea is, OK, people have dropped out. But if it's a random sort of dropout that we have, then it won't affect the overall character of the cohort we collected. And with that in mind, I went to the Office of National Statistics and National Record Scotland. We are surprisingly lucky to have uh, both these agencies making this freely available. And for the Office of National Statistics, for that particular age group, I could get the maternities and I could get, which are all births that have occurred to women for specific years. And I could go to National Records Scotland and do the same. And then I could use the collection of pregnancy history variables in the cohort to recreate exact trajectories for the fertilities of the women in the cohort and then see how many pregnancies occurred every single year for each woman in the cohort. And after collecting the data, there was uh, it's a bit more challenging in a sense that uh, for the particular age group we're looking into, uh, England and Wales release the fertility numbers in terms of aggregates. So we have them by age group. So women in the age group of 20 to 24, for example, for that year. And we don't have specific data for it. But for Scotland, we also have exact counts of the age of the mother at a specific year. So we could recreate all the women who were born in 1958 how they compare to the women who were born that particular week in 1958 and have remained in the cohort. So the first thing we did is we tried to find a way to disaggregate the data, to go from England and Wales and remove from the actual group data and create an actual curve for women who were all born in 1958, how many maternities per thousand women per year. And we started with Scotland because with Scotland, we had both the aggregates and the actual counts. It's a smaller country and they collect the data in a different way. So we tested various methods and we were lucky to find a method from the Max Planck Institute, uh, the quadratic programming spline that seemed to match perfectly the Scottish trends. The Scottish trends are in dark blue, if you can see, and the estimate from the aggregate data from the splines is the yellow one, you can see. And it follows it very closely. So we were, Quite happy with that, but again, an estimation method is just that, an estimation method. It's not going to be magic. So I went into the cohort and I also did the national statistics. So I 
use the um, spline method to create a curve for the national statistics for all women born in 1958. And then I looked at the women who have given me a complete history, complete cases, as uh, we heard from Latif earlier. So complete cases up until after the end of their fertility, and also to see women who had dropped out before the biomedical suite, before their mid forties. And we found two interesting things. The first one was for the women who remained, I also looked at terminations, because terminations are recorded in the United Kingdom under the 1967 Abortion Act and general maternities. I will not be lying to you if I told you that the fact that we have lower reported terminations in the cohort than national statistics surprised me. It did not, because I can imagine many reasons as to why this could have happened. We could have a social desirability bias. It could be the way we ask the question. If you speaking to an interviewer, you may be less willing to be upfront about parts of your history. But it does surprise me that we seem to be having different numbers in the cohort for maternities than we do uh, in the national records. We seem to have fewer um, actual maternities from both the people who remain in the cohort until after their 40s and from those who have dropped out earlier, although those who have dropped out earlier are actually a little bit closer to the national records, especially for the age group between the 20s to 30s. And we're not entirely sure why this is happening. So what we are currently doing is we're looking into the 1970 cohort to see if we're seeing similar patterns or if this is just something unusual that happened in that particular group. Now, returning to the original questions, we also wanted to see how dropouts may have affected essentially what we're trying to look into, which is fertility events. Fertility is not a snapshot in a woman's life. It's a whole story. But let's start with the timings of her first pregnancy, of her first birth specifically. And we noticed that the two uh, groups we had, the people who dropped out before 40 and the people who stayed, had slightly different profiles in terms of the timing of the first birth. We also noticed, however, that factors such as socioeconomic background and education are subtly different between the people who persisted and the people who dropped out. So, for example, we had delayed fertility, which was associated with education, which wasn't a surprising fi finding. And finally, age at menarche, which I expected to be closely linked with socioeconomic factors, but nothing else, didn't actually show any, um, any particular differences. But I do feel that in this case, the actual, uh, the actual resolution of the data that were collected for that particular event was too wide. We were collecting only data for men at age 14 or 15 or 13, which may not have the correct resolution. We need to actually understand the differences between them. I seem to have talked very quickly, <laughs> so <laughs> if there are any questions. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Maitri Khurana, uh, who's also at UCL. Maitri studied psychology at Harriet Watt University at the Dubai campus and then went on to do her MSc at UCL in clinical mental health sciences. The paper she is presenting is based on her master's dissertation, and she's currently working as an assistant psychologist at the Lighthouse Arabia Centre for Wellbeing in Dubai. So over to you, Maitri. Thank you for that. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, thank you, Jenny, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Maitri, and I will be talking about my research on the association between sensory impairments and suicidal ideation and attempt, which is a cross-sectional analysis of nationally representative English household data. So I'm just gonna get started. Okay, so suicide is of course a global public health problem. And as you can see from this graph, it's actually one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Identifying risk factors for suicide is important because it is considered to be a preventable cause of death. And one such risk factor could be the presence of sensory impairments. 
Now, individuals with sensory impairments, particularly visual and hearing impairments, tend to report a poorer quality of life and mental health. And despite both of these visual and hearing impairments having well-established associations with mental health disorders, such as depression, the current evidence base regarding their association with suicidality is rather sparse and inconsistent. With most of the, with a lot of the research saying, some of the research saying that there is an association while others saying that there isn't. Um, a lot of the current research also comes from the elderly population. So we decided to kind of bridge the gap and try to assess for the association in the general population. So our theoretical explanation for this comes from the integrated motivational volitional model, which posits that triggering events, which in this case would be the presence of sensory impairments and the communication social difficulties that they bring, um, could lead to we could create conditions for suicidal thoughts and where things like uh, defeat and humiliation come in, this could then create conditions for suicidal, uh, this could add to the suicidal ideation. And uh, where motivational factors such as thwarted belongingness and um, um, perceived burdensomeness comes in, that could again add to su the suicidal ideation. And then access to means and exposure to another suicide could then lead to suicidal attempts. So we aim to assess if there was an association between sensory impairments and suicidal attempt and ideation in the general population. Um, our, so we analyzed data from the fourth adult psychiatric morbidity survey, which was conducted in 2014. The sample consisted of English adults aged 16 and over living in private households. And the final sample set consisted of 7,546 individuals. So for our exposures in the APMS survey, there, consist, there were two questions that assessed visual impairment. They assessed nearsightedness and farsightedness. So the questions were, with your glasses or contact lenses, if you wear any, do you have any difficulty seeing ordinary newsprint at arm's length? And with your glasses or contact lenses, if you wear any, do you have any difficulty clearly seeing the face of someone across a room that is four meters or 12 feet away. We combined both of these to create a binary variable representing having a visual impairment or not. And then for hearing impairment, there was a question within the APMS that assessed, do you have any difficulty hearing or use hearing aid? And we used this binary variable as it was. Uh, we also created a general sensory impairment variable where we assessed having a sensory impairment or not. So that could be of either kind, visual or hearing. And we had a dual sensory impairment variable as well. So that was having both visual and hearing impairment at the same time. Our outcome measures, we had two outcome measures. The first one was suicidal ideation, which from the APMS survey was, have you ever thought of taking your life even though you would not actually do it? And suicidal attempt, which was, have you ever made an attempt to take your life by taking an overdose of tablets or in some other way. Both of these were measured within the past year. Um, we also had five predetermined clinical and sociodemographic variables that we considered as covariates in our models. These were gender, age, socioeconomic status, and diabetes. Just to note that we did not consider depression and anxiety as part of our final models. And the reason we did this is because they're likely to be on the causal pathway between sensory impairments and suicidal ideation and attempt. So for our statistical analysis, we used multi-level logistic regression models uh, to describe the association between each type of impairment and suicidal attempt as well as suicidal ideation. We used complete case analysis where we utilized data where they had complete information on all of our exposure and outcome variables. And uh, we conducted two sensitivity analyses where we uh, were trying to assess if missing data could be playing a role. So we used best and worst case scenarios. And we conducted two post hoc analyses. One was to assess if, um, if depression and anxiety could actually be playing a role in this relationship. So we added CISAR scores to our final models. So that's um, scores based on the revised clinical interview schedule. And we added this to our model just to assess if depression and anxiety could be playing a role. 
And we also conducted a postdoc analysis where we added each of our covariates in turn to see what effect they were having on our model. So as you can see from the results in each of the cases, um, those with sensory impairments had higher odds of having thought about suicide in the past year. And this was the case for whether, whether we looked at just the general sensory impairment, dual sensory impairment, visual or hearing. And this was the case for suicidal attempt as well, where we got much higher odds of having attempted suicide. So our main findings were that those with uh, sensory impairments had greater odds of having thought of and attempted suicide in the past year. We, uh, when we added each of our covariates in turn, we found that age was a strong negative confounder in that a lot of our uh, unadjusted models were underestimating this relationship. And um, there also appeared to be some evidence of contribution of depression and anxiety in that when we added CISAR scores, a lot of our associations did get attenuated. So some of the strengths of the study is of course that it does contribute to a very limited amount of literature that exists on this topic. We also used nationally representative data, which means our study is more likely to be generalizable. Um, our findings were adjusted for predetermined sociodemographic and clinical covariates and were also robust to our sensitivity analyses that we used um, simulating any biases that could be introduced by missing data. Um, we also need to acknowledge some of the limitations. Firstly, of course, this is a cross-sectional data set and we looked at a lot of um, longitudinal data before I started talking about my topic. And of course, this means that we can't rule out things like reverse causation. And this is particularly important when considering something like suicidal attempt because past suicidal attempt can lead to future suicidal attempts. So this is something we need to consider when looking at this study. Um, also, we need to acknowledge that sensory impaired population is quite heterogeneous, especially in terms of how they um, react to their sensory impairment. For example, there is some research that suggests that having a sensory impairment for a longer time, such as having a congenital sensory impairment, could actually have those people could actually have a better quality of life just because they can adjust to the disability better than someone who has maybe developed it more recently. Um, we also need to consider that certain settings that have populations with higher suicidal ideation and attempt could not be considered, such as inpatient units and prisons, these populations could not be explored. Um, also, because the APMS survey looks at private house, people living independently in private households, it may actually be that we may have missed out people with a higher degree of sensory impairments because they are unable to live in private households independently. So that could potentially be a limitation. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge that the measure of hearing impairment that we chose, it included people who use hearing aid. And while this obviously means that their hearing is corrected to a certain extent, we decided to be inclusive in our definition of hearing impairment because there is still studies to show that even though you, your hearing is corrected, just wearing a hearing aid adds to the stigma associated with hearing impairment and the stigma of disability. So we decided to include them anyway. Um, we also, also all of the APMS survey is self-reported measures. So of course there is the likelihood of social desirability bias. Um, and okay, so some of the interpretations and implications that come about from this study is of course, both of these impairments involve communication difficulties. That means that access to mental health care will be limited. So individuals and professionals who work closely with these populations for example, GPs, ophthalmologists, otolaryngologists, even community audiology services or opticians, if they are warned about these results and if there's a training that associates with trying to identify symptoms of suicidality, that then they could then refer them to further mental health care as well. Um, we also need to consider the factors that may be involved in this research, uh, in this association of which loneliness may be particularly important to consider in future research, because obviously having a sensory impairment can create 
a lot of um, feelings of social isolation and loneliness, so that could be a potential mediator. Other factors to consider include stigma of disability, locus of control, self-perception, self-esteem. Um, also, of course, we need to look at this in longitudinal research just to identify what the temporal nature of this relationship is. So yeah, our findings found strong evidence to support a cross-sectional association between sensory impairments and suicidal attempt and ideation. In view of the cross-sectional nature of the data, we need further longitudinal research in order to explore the temporal relationship. But yeah, thank you.